Welcome to my talk. Thank you for having me here. This talk is on designing for decentralization, principles for designing Web3 products. There's this iconic Steve Jobs quote that you may have heard. Design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. I'll repeat that. The design is not just what it looks like and feels like. The design is how it works. And this is the most important thing that we need to understand when we're designing. So we need to make products that work. And as all of us know, building in Web3, a lot of times the products don't just work. But I'll give you an example of a product that really does just work. Now, this is Uniswap. I would say one of the best designed products in Web3. It just works. I swap my tokens and it takes care of the rest. The design is how it works. And Uniswap just works. In this talk, I'll be giving advice for Web3 builders on how to build products that just work generally, but also specifically for all the nuances of building on top of Web3. This talk is for designers, it's for founders, it's for product managers, and it's also for front-end engineers and back-end engineers and smart contract engineers. Because when we look at that Uniswap example, the entire system is what made it work from the smart contracts to the front-end design. Really, this talk is for builders people that are building tools that end users enjoy. A little bit of background on me. I was a product manager at Google, the founder of a YC-backed social video chat company called Room, and now the co-founder and CEO of Stello, where we build tools to make Web3 safe and easy to understand. And throughout my whole career, my focus has been on building consumer experiences that simplify complex technology and just work. The agenda for this talk we're first going to start with three questions that you should be asking before you even get to building. Next, we're going to cover six principles of Web3 user experience. And I'll end with one hot take along the way. There are kind of at a high level, three types of design, and, and maybe there are even more. But for our purposes, there are three types of design. There's product design, and that's what the problem is. Who's the solution for? There's interaction design. How does it work? What does it do? And there's visual design, how it looks. And in this talk, I'm going to cover the first two, what I would call UX. That's product design, interaction design. Visual design, how it looks, is very important. You should build experiences that are great, but it's not my area of expertise with the background in product. Before we even get to building, we need to ask how we can tell what our success metric is. Before we get to designing, we need to know what will it look like if we've actually built a great user experience. And it's not, this looks really nice. And it's not, this is fun to use. You can tell if you've built a really great product if your usability interviews are incredibly boring. And what I mean by that is you give someone the product and every question you ask them, they're easily able to accomplish the task. The product just works. Before you start building, the first question we need to ask is who are you even building the product for? Probably the most important question, who are you building the product for? And now there's a bunch of different ways to, to slice this. Some people will think about the innovators and early adopters versus the laggards. But another way of asking it is, who is your customer in terms of their persona? Could be students or teachers, mobile native or desktop native, bleeding edge or late adopters, developers, and end users. And the reality is that it's not just one of these things. It's an intersection of these things. So it's useful to think about early adopters versus late adopters. It's useful to think about is your user or the teacher or the student. But it's even more useful to think about this holistically. The second question is, what is the job to be done? Not the task that they're trying to do, but what is the job that they're looking to hire your product for? There's this quote by Theodore Levitt, and he says, people don't want to buy a quarter-inch drill. They want a quarter-inch hole. So what is the thing that they're actually trying to do uh, and, and the, the job that you're filling in their life? In the context of some, some popular products, People don't want to call a cab, they want to get to a meeting. People don't want to go on a date, they want to find a partner. But again, if we take a step back, you could replace Uber and Bumble with products that you would never even think of as competitors. People want to go to a meeting and they can go on Zoom. People want to find a partner and they can use intramural sports. So really answering the job to be done will help you think about the alternatives to your product, even if they don't seem like they're doing exactly the same thing. I'll give you an example of a, a product that I never used, but my sisters did. And that did a great job of answering the job to be done. Children don't want a doll. They want a friend. 
ape holders don't want a picture of a monkey. They want a community. They want status. They want entertainment. And you need to build your product in a way that solves this problem in their life. And not the problem of how do you give them a picture, but the question of how do you keep them entertained or make them feel part of a community. The third question that you need to ask is what's the simplest way to accomplish the job? Now, I think that there is one dimension that people often think about products is powerful versus basic. For an example, the basic version of Uniswap would only allow you to swap ETH for USDC. And the powerful version allows you to make any swap you can imagine. There's another dimension that we need to add here, which is complex versus simple. The basic version of Uniswap and the powerful version of Uniswap are actually just as simple. They're both powerful, simple tools. One just has more functionality. The common misconception is that there's a trade-off between complexity and simplicity across the spectrum of powerful and basic, but this isn't the case. In fact, the best tools are simple across the board. Both the best and worst products are incredibly simple. And so when we're looking at this graph, there's really one answer of where we want to be. And that's powerful and simple. The best products are powerful and simple. And that's our North Star. That's our metric that we're trying to accomplish is how can we build powerful and simple products? Here are some great examples of powerful and simple products. Google, I simply type in my question and I get an answer. In Uber, I press a single button and get a ride. Notion has a total tool set of powerful commands, but it just starts with a single cursor. And Uniswap allows me to swap any two tokens imaginable, but it just has two simple inputs. These are all powerful and yet simple products. And so throughout this talk, we're going to pull out a bunch of principles. And this is the first one that's incredibly important for building great Web3 products with great UX. Make complex things simple. Okay, so... Great. We want to make complex things simple. We know that's great. But what's special about Web3? What's special about Web3 is that in Web3, we want to decentralize all the things from our infrastructure to our front ends. This is great. This is really powerful. But what does decentralization really mean? Decentralization, in my words, is protocols that can be accessed by interoperable tools built and run by anyone. And of course, there's a lot more to decentralization. But for our purposes, Decentralization is protocol that can be accessed by interoperable tools built and run by anyone. Okay, so let's take a look at the Web3 stack. You know, we have on-ramps and wallets and DEXs and marketplaces. This is just one example of a user flow of someone that wants to buy and trade an NFT. And the amazing part about this is that a user can pick any path. They can use MoonPay with Argent and One Inch and Blur, or they can pick one of a million other paths. Remember, Decentralization is protocols that can be accessed by interoperable tools built and run by anyone. What this leads to is total user control and choice and a ton of competition in the tools that we're using. Interoperable tools mean more user choice, lower costs for end users and for developers, and also that MVPs can be much slimmer. If you want to build an NFT marketplace, you don't also need to build fiat on-ramps and wallets and a DEX. You just need to focus on how you're providing value. But everything has a price. As Saul would say, everything has a price. And the hardest part about Web3 UX is that you don't control the entire user journey. Let's think about like a hypothetical user journey. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll do a case study of a hypothetical user journey. So the case study is you're building an NFT-powered game called Monkey Run. Now let's understand our user. Jen has been playing mobile games for 10 years and loves seeing how high up on the leaderboard she can get. The job to be done, Jen wants to be part of a community of serious gamers. So running through this user journey, we're going to see a bunch of different steps from setting up a wallet to on-ramping fiat, transferring, swapping, purchasing, joining, and playing. And we'll walk through the tools that Jen would use, and we'll extract principles specific to Web3 UX that we can take from it and lessons we can learn. So the first step, of course, is setting up a wallet. And that's a contentious term, the term wallet. But the reality is that people actually understand what a wallet is. My phone isn't just a phone. It does so much more than that. But at this point, people understand what a wallet does. And, and I may get flack for this. But I think you should just use terms that your users understand. In the context of MetaMask, they understand what a wallet is. It may not be the perfect term, but it's good enough. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. 
So the next principle is use terms your users understand. And for some of you building what I might call a wallet, maybe wallet isn't the right term, but for a Web3 native user, it might be. So figure out what that is for your users, but use terms your users understand. Okay, cool. The next step is we're going to have a seed phrase. This used to be a really bad experience. They would give you a seed phrase, say, write it down, and trust you to do the rest. But MetaMask has evolved over time and realized that's a very difficult experience. And they can make it easier on you while still accomplishing the same task. And so they've done that. I only need to enter in three different words here, a lot easier. And they verified that I wrote it down. After that, I'm going to go to OnRamp via Coinbase. And they're going to set up two-step verification for me. And in both of these steps, the product was really hand-holding me because they've realized that there's very difficult parts where I could fall off the wagon. So the next principle we're going to pull from this is to not trust our users to do inconvenient things that we know will come to bite them down the line if they don't do them. Whenever I set up a new wallet, I never want to write down my seed phrase, but I've lost enough seed phrases to know that I should. But it's even better when the wallet forces me to do it. I rarely set up two-factor uh, unless I'm forced to, but it's great that Coinbase forces me to. Don't trust your users to do inconvenient things if it's going to bite them down the line, if they don't. The next step is we're going to transfer from Coinbase to our MetaMask. We're going to swap that ETH for wrapped ETH. And then we're going to go purchase an NFT. And I want to call your attention to the red boxes in each of these screens that are highlighting the dollar amounts. Five years ago, this wasn't the case. But the UX has converged to a set of conventions that make the products easy to use. And when there are good conventions that a lot of people are adopting and users understand, you should use them as well, because there's probably a good reason. Sometimes there isn't, but there might be. And if you can figure out that good reason and make it easier for your users, the next principle, don't reinvent the wheel. Okay, moving on to the next step. This is the MetaMask confirmation screen when I go to wrap my ETH. And this is quite a confusing screen. I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing, whether or not it's safe. And this is where we're going to pull in my product, Stello, which will interpret this and make it easy to understand. You need to make sure you're presenting the right information for the user for the context that they're in. Now, there may be some users which need more information. For example, developers may need a lot more information about the transaction. But in this case, most users just need to know what's entering their wallet, what's leaving their wallet, and whether or not it's safe. So the next principle is present the right information. The next step is that Jen is going to join a Discord. She has to verify her assets, and then she can go on to talking within her community. And going back to the principle of understanding our users and what their job to be done is, we know that Jen wants to be part of a community of serious gamers. So if we just left her at the NFT, or we missed out on having her join a Discord, we'd really be missing out on what the job to be done is for Jen, which is to be part of a community of serious gamers. So it's really important that we use all the tools at our disposal to build an experience. And that's one of the really big benefits of Web3 is that it is about community and about entire end-to-end -end experiences. So the next principle is build an experience. It's not enough to just build a tool. You need to build an end-to-end -end experience, even if that entire experience isn't on a tool that you've built. It can be part of the user journey and the flow that you create. Okay, cool. And the last step, and this is the easy one, is to play a great game. There's got to be a better way. You know, all of these fragmented tools, they may be an experience, but they're not a great one. And one of the most exciting developments that we've seen is the ability to take these interoperable tools and build them into more integrated experiences. So here's an example on OpenSea of integrating Uniswap directly into the experience. And additionally, you can buy wrapped ETH with a card. So integrating the on-ramps as well. The power of the modular components is that all of these tools can actually just be one experience. I can set up with Magic Link, on-ramp with MoonPay, swap with the Uniswap SDK, purchase with a white label OpenSea experience and play the game all within the Monkey Run experience. I still only had to really focus on building the game, but all of these other experiences can be integrated into one application through the power of modular components built on top of decentralized infrastructure. Remember, make complex things simple. If we can take all these experiences and put them into one, that's taking a complex user journey and making it much more simple.
okay, great. You've launched the product, but your job isn't done. The job of building great products doesn't end at the launch. You need to land it. After launch, you need to do three really important things. You need to make sure you're measuring success and measuring the right things. You need to talk to your users and understand how you can make the experience better. And you need to iterate and improve. How do you actually do those things? When you're measuring the right things, make sure you're simplifying it down to the most important thing you can, which is to measure the value that you're bringing to your users. And you can do this by understanding the job to be done and the value that you're creating in their life. So measure value to your users. Talk to your users. And you do that not through building up an entire custom chat integration. Don't reinvent the wheel. Just meet your users where they are, whether that's on Discord, on Twitter, or on Snapshot. Meet your users where they are and talk to them. And lastly, iterate, but don't inconvenience them. One of the difficult things about building smart contracts is that they can be hard to upgrade. But you should make sure that you plan an upgrade path in advance, whether that's building an upgradable smart contract or making it so that you don't need to rely on hard coding in one specific contract address. Plan an upgrade path in advance. And that probably shouldn't include your users having to go burn and, and uh, mint a new NFT. Okay, taking a step back to what we learned today, we have six principles for Web3 UX. The first is to make complex things simple. The second is to use terms that your users understand. The third is don't trust your users to do inconvenient things. Don't reinvent the wheel. Build an experience and present them the right information. If there's one thing that you can take away from this talk, it's this slide. Make powerful and simple products. Make powerful and simple products. Okay, I promised a hot take, so I will give it. Despite the fact that this talk was about building great user experiences, I will say this. Amazing UX won't make your product valuable. But bad UX can make your product useless. Thank you. 